Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about the exciting topic of death and taxes. Uh, Really interesting, right? Well, probably not, but uh, it's one of the things that people tend to ignore. And in fact, you know, of all the prospective clients uh, that I meet, uh, I reckon at least 90% of them don't either have an existing will, any will at all, or an up-to-date will. And um, that, that just demonstrates, I guess, the reluctance of people to address these matters and uh, what I hope to demonstrate through this podcast is that it's actually quite simple uh, to make sure that all your affairs are in order and it doesn't necessarily cost a whole lot of money either or create a lot of complexity Um, uh, but it is very very important that it's done so you hope it's not urgent but it certainly is important so uh, what happens when a person dies well if they die with a will Uh, what happens is an executor is appointed. Uh, The executor job is to make sure that the the will is carried out and that the beneficiaries get whatever they're entitled to um, and it's their responsibility then to to fulfil those matters. Uh, If a person dies without a will, um, then what happens is they die, what's called they die intestate. Um, And essentially what, what has to happen is it has to go off to the Supreme Court the Supreme Court will then appoint an administrator, and that administrator is the person that's responsible for, for making sure the people get the beneficiaries get what they're entitled to. The Supreme Court will also determine who your beneficiaries are. So that could be your spouse, if you have one. Uh, could be, uh, depending on the size of the state, could also include children. Um, and if you're a blended family, it's it also could include children from a past marriage as well. So um, the complication, I guess, with dying intestate, there's a couple of issues. Firstly, it makes it a lot more laborious, difficult and stressful uh, for the people that you leave behind to sort of uh, go, go through the court process and, and deal with all those matters. I mean, it takes a lot of time and also a lot of money from a legal perspective. And then secondly, you know, once if you have children that you don't necessarily want to uh, inherit certain monies at a certain time. You know, if you've got a child that's uh, irresponsible with money or a child that has a, an addiction or something like that, you certainly wouldn't want them uh, to, to receive a whole bunch of money in that situation. Uh, so the best thing to do is just put a will together. Really simple, doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and I'm just, I'm going to outline through this podcast that the things that you uh, need to consider. So let's talk about the taxation consequences of dying. So essentially, I mean, lucky we're in Australia, we don't have death taxes. So the estate isn't levied tax uh, just because uh, you passed away. Um, And what happens is the assets that you pass on to your beneficiaries, essentially they inherit the the original tax nature of that debt. Uh, So that is that if you pass on an investment property to a, a child or a spouse, um, the, the cost base for in, in order to calculate the capital gains tax, should they ever sell that asset, would be whatever you paid for it originally. Um, so they really just inherit that. If it's a family home and it was a principal place of residence, um, then the estate has two years to sell that um, and still get that main residence exemption. Um, uh, so it's, it's not too complicated in terms of uh, how, how it works. Uh, now, as I said, um, sometimes people want to control assets from the grave, and that can be very difficult to do. Um, and uh, my advice is, is uh, to you is a couple of things. Have the conversations before you pass. So if there's certain beneficiaries that are excluded or um, one beneficiary is going to get more than another, uh, it's best to be really clear about that's what your intentions are and the reason why before you pass rather than uh, leaving it as a surprise and then the people that you leave behind have to deal with the consequences of that. Um, uh, make your wishes known, make your wishes very clear to your executor and make sure you you choose a good executor, someone that sort of understands money and um, understands the dynamics of your family and can really execute the wishes that, that, that you've outlined um, and then give your executor enough flexibility to be able to do that. So sometimes if we're too codified in a will, unless you're going to update it every year or a couple of years to make sure it's, it's, it's perfect for that specific time, what you're actually better off to do is leave enough um, flexibility so that the 
uh, executor can can really implement the wishes that, as you would uh, want them implemented. And possibly the best um, uh, tool to do that is including a testamentary trust into your will. So a testamentary trust is really just a discretionary trust that isn't uh, in existence yet. It only um, gets created upon your death. And uh, what you can specify in your will is uh, what assets or maybe all assets go in, into that trust. And then your executor is the trustee for that trust and obviously your beneficiaries are the beneficiary and the executor can decide what to do uh, with those assets. Um, so there's three main benefits of having a testamentary trust, asset protection, tax planning and just some practical benefits. So let me talk about very quickly about each of those. So from an asset protection perspective, if you have an at-risk beneficiary, an at-risk beneficiary might be someone that is a high risk of having a, a experience a relationship um, breakdown or marital breakdown, or could be um, uh, in a, a higher risk position because their occupation or the type of business that they're operating, um, you might not necessarily want to um, direct those monies to that person at that specific time or maybe into their personal name. Um, so by having it in a testamentary trust, um, essentially you're protecting it from any leakage as a result of those actions. So whether it's an action by a creditor or a relationship breakdown, so a family court matter. Um, so that's, that's obviously useful. Now I've got two sons, uh, so I've got a testamentary trust in my will. Uh, the assets, all my assets go into that testamentary trust. Um, and then if, if one of my sons is um, expecting a relationship breakdown, well, th then my executor can decide not to give him any money yet um, because uh, obviously if he does that, it goes into the marital asset pool and it's at risk. Uh, the next benefit, there's lots of um, potential uh, tax-saving measures that, that could materialise, but probably the biggest one is that um, beneficiaries or anyone that receives an income from a testamentary trust that is under the age of 18 is taxed as an, at adult rates, not minor rates. So if you if you distribute money to a minor, that they um, uh, pay significantly more taxes than than what a, an adult does, and so typically you can only give sort of 400 bucks to a minor, and anything over that gets taxed at the highest marginal rate. Well, if if they receive income from a testamentary trust, they can receive essentially 18,200 dollars tax free each year. So it's a great situation where you might have children that are under age of 18 or grandchildren. Um, you can put all your assets in a testamentary trust and then if it allows your children, who, who are probably are the primary beneficiaries, to then distribute those monies each year to the grandchildren on paper um, and so that allows them to minimise tax. So really uh, lots of tax savings and obviously then uh, same with capital gains tax can uh, distribute it and spread it across a uh, number of family members. And then the practical benefits of having a testamentary trust. So consider a situation where you've got two, be two beneficiaries, you've got two children. Um, one child has a very low asset base. One child is very quite financially strong. Um, you've got a bunch of assets. Uh, one child wants to sell those assets and take the money to you know, go buy a home or do whatever they do. That's the one that's the weaker financial position. Uh, the one in a stronger financial position thinks they're great assets, I don't want to sell them. Um, and so the, the, if you've got, say, two properties, they're not necessarily going to be identical in value. In fact, they're almost not going to be identical in value. So um, one, one solution there is to um, put both properties inside a testamentary trust, sell one that provides enough liquidity to pay out one of the children, um, and then they can either retain a small entitlement to that testamentary trust or establish two testamentary trusts, in fact, um, and then the... the um, beneficiary that wants to hold on to the assets is is fine to do so. So from a practical perspective, it's a lot easier uh, to uh, implement your strategies that way. While I'm uh, here talking about estate planning, just a couple of other small uh, issues as well. While you're doing wills, you should certainly do power of attorneys. You would typically have two types of power of attorneys, an enduring power of attorney, which deal with financial and other matters, and then a separate medical power of attorney. Essentially what a power of attorney does is, is give the authority for people to make decisions, and when they make decisions on your behalf, it's as if you've, from a legal effect, it's as if, as if you've made the decision yourself. Um, so uh, power of attorneys are, are useful um, that is, enduring power of attorneys are useful if you travel, for example, and documents need to sign or be signed or decisions need to be made while you're away and not contactable. 
or um, if you um, yeah, lose a bit of capacity, so sort of for obviously much older people, parents and so forth, um, sometimes they don't have necessarily the capacity to, be able to make those decisions or important decisions, and you can do that on their behalf. Uh, same with medical. They, they obviously can um, decide in terms of how your medic, medical treatment is um, implemented. Superannuation uh, falls outside your estate, so it doesn't include it in the state. And, and, and the same with if you've got assets inside a, a trust, you know, a trust will stay inside the trust whether you're alive or, or not. Um, same with joint assets. If you've got joint assets, um, that they also don't fall inside your estate. Uh, the ownership just transfers to the remaining joint assets, uh, joint owners, I should say. Um, but in particular, super isn't included in your estate. So what you need to do is complete a binding or non-binding death benefit nomination um, and provide that to your super fund. And those have to be updated every uh, three years. You would normally nominate your uh, a financial dependent, so a spouse or child or so forth as a beneficiary um, as that way they can receive the benefit and it won't be taxed um, uh, and the trustee of the super fund must decide where to pay it so if you've got a binding death benefit nomination for example then they're bound to follow whatever your nomination is but just as an addendum to the will um, or looking after the will uh, that's that's something you need to consider uh, in order to put wills together um, if you uh, have a very basic situation, so if you're you know, uh, younger, you're single, um, you don't have a lot of assets, you don't have anyone special you'd like to look after in the event of your passing, then you probably need a really basic will and getting a, a, a cheap will kit from Aussie Post or something like that will probably just do the job. Uh, if you have um, uh, significant assets, borrowings, uh, children, a spouse, people you'd like to look after, and so forth. Then you, then you best place to get a, a lawyer to put that uh, together for you. And uh, wills with power of attorneys uh, and a testamentary trust um, probably cost in the order of around I don't know uh, two and a half, three thousand uh, dollars from a good quality. Uh, estate planning lawyers as someone that's specialist in that area so in the whole scheme of things there's not a lot of money uh, to spend to make sure that your affairs are in order and everything's going to get looked after uh, so i hope that uh, this podcast has been of uh, assistance uh, of course there's more information in the show notes and links and so forth um, and if you're enjoying the podcast please do share uh, tell your friends and family and get them to listen in uh, it's the best way to sort of spread the word help me spread the word Okay, until next week, bye for now.